Morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Discovery. We're very pleased that you could join us again. My name is Alison Mostowicz. I am the Director of Engagement at Efficiency Canada. I am joining you from Calgary, Alberta, home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Uh, while we are a remote workplace, Efficiency Canada is based at Carleton University, which is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. So we'll get started. We have a quick presentation, roughly usually around 20 minutes, and then we will open the floor to questions. To kick us off today, we've got Corey Diamond with us, who is the Executive Director of Efficiency Canada. Many of you probably have met him. So Corey is going to join us today to talk about some of the critical policy areas that we see in 2023 to reaching Canada's climate goals and what Efficiency Canada is doing to help achieve those policy goals. Corey, I will hand the floor to you. Thank you so much, Allison. Hi, everyone. Despite what a Larry David says, and you can look it up, I'm still going to say Happy New Year, <laughs> even though the statute of limitations has passed. But it is great that we are here in a new year, which is a new beginning and new focus and new sort of renewed energy from being off for the break. So I thought it would be a good chance for Efficiency Canada to describe what our focus areas are for the year, what we plan on doing. And, and then have a discussion at the end on that. Most people know this, but there is a lot of science out there about how often you need to hear messages in order for it to sink in. I do like to start every presentation with just outlining who Efficiency Canada is. We are the national voice for an energy efficient economy. And for us, all our work is around unlocking the potential that energy efficiency can have through policy so that we achieve three things, a sustainable environment, a productive economy, and a just an equitable society. So that is our raison d'etre. That is everything that we do every day with this small group of people. As Alice mentioned, we are based at Carleton University. There's a center there called the Sustainable Energy Research Center. We are part of that. And as, as Alice also mentioned, Carleton is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Now you'll notice we like to number things. Three is a sort of a magic number for us on a lot of things. And uh, at Efficiency Canada, being a quasi think tank, and being based at a university, obviously research is a core part of our theory of change, but none of us ever really wanted to join an organization or, or lead an organization that just cranked out papers and research and had only a small number of people read them. What we wanted to do is use that research to change the world. And so our theory of change or our model of, of making that happen is what we call internally the three-headed beast. And so obviously research, many of you have seen a lot of our research and see the work that we do to identify the best policies and strike a conversation about the types of things that governments across the country can do. Um, but the other two heads of the beast are equally as important. We do a lot of communications, both in traditional media, getting the word out there and starting to try to simplify exactly how to enact these changes, as well as a lot of work on social media. And that's where many of you see our daily drip of information. But engagement is a huge piece of the three-headed beast model as well. And uh, Allison does a great job in things like discovery and bringing people together in various different ways. And we also do a lot of work in trying to organize and mobilize the sector to get active politically. We are in a, a fight for attention with all levels of government, and therefore we need to develop strategies for all of you to amplify this message in the best way that you can by speaking to your elected officials and to getting loud to be loud as well. So that's the model and the theory of change. And before I get into the actual sort of areas that we apply or attach that theory of change to, I was reminded by a quote from a tragedy hip song called The Rules. And and so I wanted to outline a few rules from today's conversation before you jump into the question and answer into the chat. The first is to listen and try to situate yourself or see yourself in this. For us, this is not just a group of people trying to do something. This is a big tent and we're only successful if you are successful as well and that you see yourself as playing a role in the thing that we're trying to do. So that's number one is that's the number one rule today is just listen and try to envision where you fit into this. The second rule is you can't get mad at us for these priorities. We know that energy efficiency is an extremely complex, sophisticated and fractured policy area. There are literally dozens, if not hundreds of little policies that need to be tweaked. 
And then we know that the list that we're going to share with you today is not comprehensive. There are things in it that are not there. And sometimes you just have to make some choices and, and prioritize the work based on the maximum impact you have. So at the end of this, you are allowed to outline an area maybe that, that we could focus on, but you just don't get mad at us. <laughs> and then the third rule is engage with us either today on discovery and give us some feedback, chats, comments, questions, and things like that. And, uh, but even beyond, we really welcome your engagement in everything that we're trying to do. But all that we ask today and beyond is no sales pitches. It's discovery is meant to share information and to strike a dialogue. We don't want to hear from you on why your specific product service solution is better and the best thing to implement above everyone else. Okay. So those are the rules, guaranteed or not. So the first issue area that I wanted to talk about, and, and each one of these five areas is going to have, I think, at least three slides. And first, we're going to talk about what we've accomplished. Secondly, what we're trying to achieve this year. And then thirdly, the policies are the areas that we're going to work on. Many of you have interacted with us on our codes and standards work. And my colleagues, Kevin and Shireen, lead this work. Kevin is humble about it, but he is a building code celebrity in this country. And we've done a lot of work over the last few years related to getting the 2020 model building code up and running. There is an acceleration fund coming from the federal government to encourage the adoption of that very shortly. We also, for the very first time, got ministerial authority over federal model building codes, which is a huge deal to connect the government's climate ambition to the process to deliver and implement energy efficient codes. We also help to uh, get commitment around the evolution of codes towards a net zero emissions code and not just energy. And then a huge thing that we've done is we've built a network of advocates. There are people across the country that are coming together to help advance this in every region in the country. And that's a really exciting thing to see from an organizing standpoint. What are we trying to achieve next year? For us, it's important that the information, the knowledge we have, and the position that we play in to give activists and supporters all the tools that they need in order for them to take action. Building codes are a regional issue, provincial and municipal, municipal issue. And it's very difficult for a national organization like us to essentially be involved at every single level of government and at every decision point. So we want to make sure the information we have is active and out there and given to all of you. Second area is we want to work very closely with municipalities. We've been working on a project for about eight months with municipalities and ensuring that they have a strong understanding of their role in this. Across the country, we're seeing a lot of movement at the municipal level on the use of codes and standards to advance net zero ambition. And so we're trying to connect that to the role they play in implementing codes. And then lastly, we will be very active at the federal level in the development of this net zero emissions code, which has a long way to go, a lot of work to do. And so we want to make sure we're involved in that from an early standpoint. So those are three things that we want to achieve this year. And we apply that and all that work to a number of policies that are active in the ecosystem. Obviously, many of you know that the 2020 model building code was released, ironically enough, in 2022, but notwithstanding it's out there and, and provinces have 18 months to adopt one of the tiers of it. So we'll be doing some work to encourage that adoption and, and have done a lot of work in getting the federal government to, to advance some money to provinces and municipalities so that they can make that happen. Obviously, the net zero emissions code, the goal from the federal government is to have that ready by 2024. That is a huge lift. So we need to keep an eye on that and support making sure that's as strong as possible. And we'll look to a lot of you to help us with that. At the municipal level, there are a couple of areas that are really exciting and important developments across the country. One is what are called green development standards. So municipalities acting and creating standards for new buildings, and then also building performance standards, which could happen at uh, the provincial level as well. But more often than not in the U.S., we're seeing that happen at the municipal level, and that would be for existing buildings. And then the last policy area is there, there is in another process in this sort of arcane world of codes that is focused on existing buildings and developing for the first time a federal approach to trying to encourage energy efficiency upgrades at the time of an alteration to a building. So all those policies are all active and live and happening, and we're going to apply our work and our, our sort of three-headed beast model to those things. So that's the codes and standards world. And again, we encourage you to see yourself in that and, uh, and reach out to us if you see that you can play a role in helping to advance it.
The second area of focus for us is called clean heat. And this is essentially ensuring that uh, the way buildings are heated in this country are done so at the lowest emissions standard that we can. We have done a little bit of work on this in the past, although we're putting a much bigger emphasis and focus on this moving forward because of the impact this can have. Many of you have seen and interacted with our energy efficiency scorecard each year. So we've been tracking these types of policies. We help to get the federal government to to implement funding programs that start to think about how we're going to do this. Obviously, the, the Greener Homes program is providing incentives, but thinking about this through the lens of our mission-oriented approach through the report we came out with in 2021, programs like the Retrofit Accelerator, Greener Neighborhoods programs will be active very soon from the federal government with the recognition that we need to be moving to an entire system where clean heat is at the center of it. Um, and then the green building strategy federally as well, uh, helping to influence that through our comments and advice and collecting and collaborating with many of you. So that stuff is in there as well. And also getting a lot of media attention across the country around the need for this. And we've been very active as talking heads on this topic. So what are we trying to achieve this year? There are a couple of things. One is there's a lot of talk around how we encourage and accelerate clean heat. For us, we want to put out there as much as we can and develop very clear policy options to make this happen in the country and uh, put out there what exactly can happen at various different levels of government so that they are working together as effectively as they can and as fast as we can at the scale we need to move. And secondly, as part of that is to build a broader coalition of organizations who are working on this, associations who have uh, members in the trades that do this, and bring a broad coalition together to make this all all these types of options feasible for implementation by whatever level of government we are working on. We do know that some provinces and municipalities are moving really fast on policies related to clean heat and very aggressively. And we also know that there is in the green building strategy or an intention through the emissions reduction plan federally to look at this as well. So we're very active in thinking about the role that we can play in that. And there are policies across the country on this. So federally, there are two that we're working on, clearly the Energy Efficiency Act, also this alteration to existing building code, but there's a lot of different regulatory pathways this could happen. Out in BC, there's a number of clean BC regulations that are related to this. And then even in, at the municipal level of the city of Vancouver and other cities across the country who are also doing that. So lots of different opportunities to work on this. For us, it's really trying to get a handle first and foremost on what those policy options, the most feasible policy options, how they could all work together at the three different levels, and then put together some opportunities to make it happen. Okay, so the third area that we're going to work on, and again, for those that follow Discovery and have been following our work, last week we had an excellent Discovery session. I think it was the longest one we've ever had because of so much interest and questions and answers, but it's, a, it's our work on energy justice. We have been very active on this for a number of years. Years. As a result of that, we've seen an additional $500 million in support for regional low-income programs. They are focused on oil to heat pumps and not as comprehensive as we'd like, but nevertheless, some recognition, very strong recognition that affordability needs to be baked into any long-term transition to net zero. We published an efficiency for all report. So if anybody's interested in the basics of what this issue is and where Canada stands on this from a regional perspective, and then what the gap our federally, that report has it all. And you can understand where your region may be and what needs to happen in order to accelerate. Um, and a big part of this, as you see in our theory of change, is bringing people together. My colleague, Abby, leads uh, what's called the community of practice of activists from lots of different sectors and academics, bringing people together to advance this and to think of different strategies to make it happen. And as a result of that, we have mobilized a lot of our constituents to meet with their MPs. I think we've had over 40 or 50 meetings and, and lots of media attention on the issue. So there's a lot of work that we have done, but still we are not close to where we need to be as a country on this and we we'll continue to push and advocate. So in 2023, we are obviously continuing to look for a broader investment in energy justice so that everyone in the country has access to these types of incentives and programs and, and no one is left 
left behind. We have been very active in helping to advocate for inclusion of affordability, energy justice in the green building strategy and, and look towards that strategy as, as having this as a core principle and a core part of, of the plan in Canada. And then lastly, we want to achieve a broader understanding across the country and the intersection of how energy fits in with other issues and namely the role that it plays and how it could impact the rights of tenants and those that rent their units from in buildings across the country. And what we want to see is a policy mix between advancing more aggressive energy efficiency for those that need it, but not messing things up for tenants who have potentially tenable living arrangements and using energy efficiency as an excuse to potentially renovate or evict people. So we're going to really look at that and we want to achieve just a stronger understanding across the country on it. So the policies, one is just money. There is a federal budget coming up this spring and we have been calling very aggressively for a $2 billion investment in it. And then combining that investment and that sort of strategy that we're looking at the federal government to lead is looking at the way that can then be connected to other policies that, uh, that various different departments can play in helping to ensure that tenant rights are respected and enshrined in any of the types of programs or strategies that, that they work on. So that's a policy mix that is, uh, is going to be part of our energy justice work. Okay, the fourth area. We call this provincial policies. And so to date, we have been delivering the provincial energy efficiency scorecard every year. Plus last year, we for the first time, created a comparison amongst uh, the states and the provinces to see how we stack up against best in class jurisdictions. We have, and many of you may not know this, but you should, we have a national database of programs and policies that you can slice and dice by region, slice and dice by type of program or policy that is fully available to the public on our website. And uh, that's something that, that has been used by a lot of different policymakers and uh, private sector companies to better understand where things are at. And then as part of that, we've been able to influence not just the provincial policymaking through the sort of ranking and benchmarking, but also outlining that the federal government has a role to play to fill in the gaps between what DESs can do. And each year that report and the work around it does get significant media attention as well as the attention of incumbent governments uh, who may not be as high as they could be on the ranking and as a result are being called out by opposition parties and other advocates. So this year, we're going to take a little bit different tactic. We are not going to be releasing or publishing an actual report this year. We're moving that to every two years. But as a result, we're going to take a different strategy and go deeper into specific provincial policy issues, things like uh, fuel silos, things uh, looking at utilities and the regulation around utilities. We want to go deeper into to some specific issues rather than thinking broadly. And as part of that, we want to have more frequent outputs, more rapid responses to developments, maybe more sort of one pagers or, or things related to what's happening across the country so that we can see action based on policy windows that may be coming up. It still requires a lot of the same tracking and information sharing and, and collecting. And so we'll continue to do that. You just won't see the sort of end of year report that you typically would in the fall. And then thirdly, a variety strategy for the database. We want more people to use this database. How do we make it more effective? What can we add to it? How do we present the information that's in this, uh, this rich database so that people can use it more and advance their own organization's goals, but also encourage policymakers to, to drive it even faster. So the specific policies that you'll see us work on, obviously, like we do each year around program savings at the provincial level. We are going to look at utility system sort of regulatory policies and see if there's a way to continue to, to push on that. And based on some funding that we're waiting on, potentially looking much deeper, as I mentioned, into fuel switching and fuel silo programs and trying to go a little bit deeper into areas where we'd like to, because there's a huge impact available to us if we can make some changes there. Okay, if you're still with us and you're still listening, we got one more and then I'll open it up for questions and answers. So the fifth area that we want to work on, and this I think is the most exciting and passionate, forward-thinking, fun area for us to work on. And in fact, the first four don't happen in, unless this one is, is advanced as well. And that's making sure that the energy efficiency sector is as large and has as much capacity as possible to undertake all the work that we will see happening over the next decades to advance Canada to a net zero future. 
So to date, we've done a lot of work in this. Many of you have seen our Energy Efficiency Champions program through Our Human Energy. We now have a group of career guides that are mentoring people across the country and encouraging people to come into the sector. We've launched the very first Energy Efficiency Careers website. You can check it out at discovere.ca. And uh, that has a job board, has pathways to training, has a, a, a general understanding of what it takes to get into this sector and try and encourage people from across the country country to, to think of a role or a career in this sector. We also do Energy Efficiency Day, which I think is the most fun event that we do, just getting everybody to stand up and celebrate the great work that we all do in this sector. We have over 200 organizations in the country participate, and this last year for the first time we got to actually do in-person events across the country, six different cities, and we'll be doing more of that this year as well. And then just generally getting some media attention. It's one thing if you get some media to talk about a policy. An arcane world of codes and standards or what specific policies we need to adopt. But it's quite another thing when you get a story about somebody. And I think that human brains work on stories and are able to ingest ideas based on stories. And a lot of the media attention that we get, we try to connect to local people who are doing this great work so that people can see themselves in this sector and are excited to join it and to continue to drive it. So that's some stuff we've done to date. And this year, we want to continue to grow the sector and diversify it. You'll see our human energy continuing to grow and the career guides program. And we also want to gain a stronger understanding of what makes up the sector itself. So getting some more data on the labor market and what we can do. And again, if we get some funding, explore how we can develop and encourage new business models in this country so that there is more capacity to do this work. So that's this year. And my last slide, Allison, before you interrupt me and tell me I'm almost done, is, as I said at the beginning, one of the rules is to try to see yourself in this work. And there are lots of opportunities to get involved with us. We like to think of this theory that I learned from a company called Realize Worth, where I used to work, around meeting people at their highest level of contribution. What that means essentially is that anybody can get involved in the work we do based on where they are at and what their level of contribution is. At Efficiency Canada, we have as an allies program, lots of companies, almost 50 companies from around the country, organizations, nonprofits join us and see themselves in it. If we're successful in helping to advance this type of policy environment, then those organizations will be successful as well. So you and your organizations can join us at various different levels that fit your needs to join as allies. We currently have some roles open for our regional champions program. These are volunteers in every province and territory in the country who can give us an idea of where things are at regionally, what policy windows may be open, and then mobilize the research and the work that we're doing. We can see some action in their province or territory. Connect with us on that if you're interested. And then there are two areas within that are more specific to, to areas or specific issues. We have an ABC Council, which is our Building Codes Advocates Network, and we have our Low Income Community Practice. So if that's of interest to you, you can either join that or find out who your representative is in your area of the country and connect with them. But we also give you lots of opportunities to take action. You can meet with your elected official. You can sign on to all our calls of action. We can even join us through tweeting to representatives. There's lots of different ways at various different levels to get involved. And we really encourage people who are on our list to do that. And then we also ask people to mobilize our research. We are very good at sharing times what we're working on. And we just ask people to amplify it through their networks. And that may be the easiest action you can take. And that may be enough. Just the more people read and hear about our stuff, the more action that we can see happen through policymakers. And then lastly, if you don't want to do anything except just receive information, you can join our list. If you go to efficiencycanada.org and you go to the top right corner, all you got to do is put in your email address and you'll receive information about us. And if that's your highest level of contribution, we 100% welcome it. Our role is to bring as many people together as we can. And if that's where you're at, then we'll take it. So lots of different opportunities to get involved. As I was saying, and I'll conclude with this five key issue areas using the three-headed beast model by a group of people based at Carleton working on their computers across the country 
it is great. But if it doesn't also connect and bring all of you together and the thousands of people across the country that work in this sector, then it's not maximizing the potential that energy efficiency can have. So this really is a call to action to everyone to join us at whatever level they can and through whatever contribution they can through their time or their talent and their money. And then we'll, we'll continue to see the success that we've been having today. I'll end it there. I'm happy to answer any questions people may have. And also I'm available. And so is Allison after the session through email and others ways of communication if you'd like to connect more. So thank you. Thanks so much, Corey. Small organization, big ambitions. <laughs> okay, so we've got a few questions already in the chat. If anything popped up for you during the session, or if you have any ideas that you want to share, we're also happy to hear those. I'm happy to talk about those. Couple, couple questions and a suggestion in there. The first question, and Corey, I'm happy to help out with this one, is about how we're including First Nations, including federal and provincial government agencies like Indigenous Services Canada, CMHC, AFN, Tribal Council, Housing Authorities, and Collective. So did you want to start? And I was going to say, you could start as you're helping to lead some of that. So maybe I, I don't, yeah, give an example mm -hmm. of one or two things you're doing, and then I can add to it. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we recognize that as a non-Indigenous organization and with largely non-Indigenous is that's not our space to wade in and to lead certain things there. So I think that's really important to start off with that. We have a really, I believe, realistic understanding of our place in that and a respectful understanding of our place. So we do a lot of work through partnership. So right now we have a really good reciprocal partnership, Indigenous Clean Energy, and we're working on creating a new partnership with for example, the National Urban, Rural, and Northern Indigenous Housing Coalition. So that was just struck November 22nd, 2022. So those partnerships and helping to understand where they're at, what they're advocating for, and then using our respective strengths to move each other's work forward is where we're building a lot of this relationship. So that can include sharing research, sharing data, signing on to each other's letters, supporting each other in ways like that. So those are some examples of the work that we do with these Indigenous organizations. And that's at a broader scale. Corey also mentioned that we have the low-income community of practice. So that's another way that we engage with organizations. So especially the housing organizations, we're finding a lot Lot of parallels there and a lot of ways to support each other's work through the specific policy areas. Typically when we are working on those policy areas, we do have partnerships and we do have specific organizations we'll go to to talk about certain issues and how they can advance certain issues with their own policy asks in mind. So there is very much a reciprocal component to it. Corey, did you want to add to that? Yeah, and I guess the point, the main point of that is we do have a huge list of supporters and, and an ability and the tools to mobilize people to take action. And so we want to use that list around the priorities that, that many Indigenous communities or peoples are looking for. So that's a strategy around it. I will say that this is an area that we have to do more. We are starting that journey and now since leading a number of really interesting partnerships. But there is a lot more that we can be doing and building out those relationships is the first step and then supporting around what is required or what is asked for by Indigenous communities is the next step. So we will be doing more of this work and, and look to working with any of you who maybe have opportunities for us to support. Okay, so the next couple questions are about the low-income energy efficiency work that we're doing. Very specific question about where the $2 billion is being requested from. Yeah, so this is an ask of the federal government. We came up with the number around $2 billion because it matches a sort of annual investment that the federal government is making on other programs to support the types of retrofits that we want to see. We know that low-income people across the country, those that are experiencing energy poverty, require a different type of strategy than the typical get an energy audit, pay up front for your equipment, and then go through the process to receive the reimbursement or part of the reimbursement or the grant. We also know that loans that have been made available, not only by the federal government, but also by some municipalities through PACE funding are also very difficult for millions of people across the country who are living in energy poverty. So we're asking the federal government specifically to continue to support this through NRCAN and then asking NRCAN to adopt a certain number of principles that they could use to in order to get this money out as fast and as effectively as possible. They have adopted, as I said, in the oil to heat pump programs that they've announced, which is about $500 million. Mm -hmm. Some of the principles in there are some of the things that we've been talking about, which is avoid that upfront cost that somebody who is living on a smaller budget 
can't just afford to do that. So they are looking at a specific program design that enable people to receive the money up front. And then secondly, work with regional partners across the country who already have deep connections and communities where low-income people live. And it looks like the design or the release of those, the implementation of those programs are going to do that as well. So really what we're doing is trying to look for the federal government to invest in it and create the strategy, but then work with the network of regional delivery partners who can help. And then just a quick follow-up question on that. So the $2 billion, how far do we see that getting people above the energy poverty line? Or do you estimate that we'll likely need more? Oh yeah, we're going to need a lot more. And if you were at the seminar or the webinar last week, the weatherization assistance program in the U.S. has been around for 40 years. So there's a lot more to do. $2 billion would be a start. $500 million is a start. So I do want to make sure that there's a recognition that like finally with the federal government about the importance of this as part of a green building strategy. But yeah, $2 billion, I don't know the exact number of how many homes. I'm sure Abby and our team has done the math or is looking at the math, but is a start for sure. And we need a lot more, not just from the federal government, but through our benchmarking work, we know how much money is being spent across the country by provincial governments, and they need to continue to amp this up as well. Absolutely. And then in the same vein in that policy area, could you just talk a little bit about the different groups we're working with that are already delivering services, how important they are, and then how we're working with them? Yeah. So our community of practice includes a pretty wide, diverse group of people, implementers, or people who are delivering these types of programs, like Empower Me is doing some excellent work across the country on this. So we've got folks like that, advocates who are working on this. We are working with a number of academics across the country so that we have a better and stronger understanding of what is it going to take in order to help eliminate energy poverty in this country. And more, as especially as we're doing this tenant rights work, where the network of community of practice includes people who aren't typically involved in sort of our field, right? Strictly energy efficiency or climate advocacy. It's, uh, it's people who are working on poverty issues, who are working on energy justice issues, people who are working at the local level on this. And we're trying to bring them in as well because they have a view or a lens on the role that energy poverty plays much, much wider than we would specifically by looking at the energy side of it. If you want to reach out to us, we can share who's in it and maybe even join one of the calls and you can see the types of actors that are part of this. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. So let's switch to clean heat. So <laughs> this was an easy question. So does clean heat also include clean cooling? Yeah, so excellent point. One of the policy areas that we're thinking about exploring more of is the role of essentially the installation of an air conditioner also essentially mandating that any new air conditioner also be a heat pump. And this is something that I want, one of our colleagues, Abby, was involved in helping to design that kind of program or approach in the U.S. And we're going to look at that as one of the options. We know that in on both coasts of BC and Nova Scotia, that cooling and the right to cooling is becoming a real issue. And if we can influence the installation of the right type of cooling at the time that people are doing this, then you can make sure that cooling system is also a heating system. And then therefore you don't need to then retrofit down the road or add to your central air conditioning system with another heat pump. So that's an area that we want to explore. What would it take to adopt something like that in Canada? How would it look? How would it work across the various different levels of government? So that is one area that we definitely want to look at. Fantastic. Okay. So in terms of switching to capacity building, are we planning any work or have we done something on the skills or business capacity in energy efficiency areas? So some of the examples used were installers for solar heat pump EV charging systems. So let me just outline just what I think where there's expertise in, from other groups that we try to use in our sort of work. So we know that groups like Eco Canada and the Canada Green Building Council have outlined specifically looking at a specific trades or markets and what the labor is going to be required in order to undertake all the activity in this country. So I really encourage you to look at the energy efficiency employment study that Eco Canada did and Canada Green Building Council released a report, I think in 2021, that specifically states the number of each job that we're going to need based on the targets that, that the country has. So that's really excellent sort of modeling work. Our sort of work is going to do two things. One is based on all that, what can we do from a sort of a campaign or a communications perspective to show people that this is a fast growing, exciting place to be? 
to have a meaningful paying job for life? And can we do something to encourage people to even understand that and to learn about the various different opportunities? So that's a place that nobody else is fulfilling and we'll do that. The second thing is even if we get every HVAC contractor, every electrician, every architect, every existing person who is in this space to do the things that we need to do, we're not going to get to where we need to be. So we also need to layer on existing ways of doing business with new business models. So I mentioned that in, in that section. And we hope if we funding comes to do some work this year, what it will take to look at, for example, the HVAC sector and how to work with the HVAC sector on what it needs in order to advance these types of solutions faster and bigger in a scale than they are today. And that could look at different types of things like potentially creating new businesses that do look at more than just HVAC, but also things like envelope or windows, but it can also look at what kinds of supports can governments provide to these businesses so that they become more engaged in this transition and not just expect them to install just more heat pumps, just make them happen. We need to provide those types of supports like have happened in other industrial sectors. So that's where we're going to play more like how to create this as a fun place to be an exciting, passionate world and bring people in. And then also look at the future about what, what needs to happen to the subsector ready for the transition. Can I just maybe go a little further on one of those? Sure. So one of the one of the things we do at Efficiency Canada is we bring together associations and you can see the list of our great allies and on our website and they will often bring up some of these issues they're facing and how we can work together to bring it to the attention of the federal government and that may be outside of a campaign that we're actually working on. And so th this is a huge barrier for a lot of the organizations and a lot of the associations we talk with on a regular basis. And also to say that the training part, there are so many awesome existing training programs and it's like somebody said in the comment, instead of reinventing the wheel, how do we do a better job of working as a community of energy efficiency practitioners to support the training that already exists? Because, you know, you have organizations like Passive House that have amazing training regimens. And even Eco Canada has lots of free resources for people really to understand that it exists and how do we do a better job of highlighting that it exists. So that's part of our workforce development as well. So I think we've got time for one more question. And this one's kind of along the line of the low income energy efficiency as well. So it's about PACE programming and just the accessibility of specific programming. So have you seen examples of programs that work more effectively than PACE that can incorporate the low income community that can't necessarily afford loans? or will not take out a loan is what we've seen with our research. Yeah, my experience or knowledge of PACE, I'm not a PACE expert, is, is that they typically oversubscribe really fast. And you're right, they are typically taken up by people who are either on their way and have a good, strong understanding of the system we're in, and one that that, you know, that they can just like latch on to all the other things they're doing, like accessing a grant or finding their own contractors and things like that. So I don't know of any specific examples, Shannon, and maybe Abby on our team can, so I'll connect you guys. But I will say that if you are thinking or looking at developing a strategy around trying to make sure that those living in energy poverty are using your PACE program, it will require a completely different strategy. And maybe that's what you're asking for as examples for that strategy. So I think you're getting that. And for anyone else listening, it's going to be very difficult to use the same sort of communication channels and expect you're going to get that type of result. But we also need to make sure that that everything is done as much as possible upfront from a program design perspective. It's going to be very hard to, to encourage those who are low-income Canadians to take on more debt. So if it is a zero interest loan, then that definitely can help. But the handholding and the work ahead of time is going to be extremely important. There may be some information in the U.S. of some organizations that have done things like this and have developed those type of wraparound services. So you may want to look at AC or the Alliance Save Energy to see if there are some examples like that, but I don't have any sort of a top of my head. Okay, so with that, we will come to a close for the day. So thank you so much, Corey, for joining us. And I'll just encourage anybody that has other questions they didn't want to put in the question and answer to reach out to Corey or myself. We're happy to chat anytime about really anything. So this will be posted in about a week on our, our website. Our newsletter is going to start to go out again. So we're really excited about that. We did a whole revamp of the newsletter. So look out for that in your inbox and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Allison. Bye. Bye.